You're watching HCAM's Government Channel, where we provide coverage of the latest meetings and events happening in Hingham's local government. For more Hingham news, tune into HCAM's public channel on Comcast 97 and Verizon Fios 31, and educational channel on Comcast 22 and Verizon Fios 29. Okay, good evening everyone. It's uh, Thursday, January 12, 2017. Calling the uh, Board of Selectmen for the Town of Hingham meeting to order. Uh, there are no minutes at this juncture. Uh, at this time, I invite uh, Mr. Manning to join us at the table uh, to uh, discuss with us the uh, ratif proposed vote to ratify the Department of Public Works Supervisor contract. Absolutely. Um, Marie Harris. Ladies and gentlemen, um, both of our residents here happen to be members of the uh, Ing Personnel Board. Pay closer. Jack, how are you? Did you explain to us briefly? Absolutely. We'll make it very brief. Thank so, you. So, uh, Jack Manning, member of the Personnel Board, uh, 32 Bel Air Road. Marie Harris, on Personnel Board, 15 U.S. Bates Road. And uh, thank you for, for inviting us in tonight. Um, we're very pleased to, uh, to tell you that uh, we have reached an agreement uh, with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, the Local 25. Um, which represents the, the DPW supervisors. So uh, th this is a uh, this is a new unit of the uh, the DPW. Um, prior to this, there was just uh, one bargaining unit, which was really the rank and file. Um, and then um, uh, earlier this year, or perhaps the end of last year, uh, we got word that the the DPW supervisors were going to be forming a separate unit. So we negotiated. Uh, we were looking forward to the conversations and. Uh, um, that we met uh, about uh, six, nine months ago uh, to start the process. Um, it took, uh, it took a, a bit of time to get through the process. Uh, and uh, it was a, an incredibly rewarding experience. Uh, these were uh, gentlemen who, um, if you know anything about the DPW supervisors that we bargained with, these are gentlemen who have worked for the town for um, as little as 21 years in the case of one individual and as many as 38 years in the case of one of the other individuals. So these are long-term employees who have spent a lot of time and given a lot of their years to uh, service to the town. So uh, it was a great group to meet with. Um, we sat down and, uh, and bargained. Um, we concluded with an agreement uh, which covers a three-year period. Um, and um, there were several things that uh, the DPW supervisors were really interested in, in, uh, in trying to bargain for. One was uh, an across-the-board increase or a cost-of-living increase, if you will. Um, and what we ended up agreeing to was, uh, and we kept, uh, we kept in, um, in our minds, of course, the fact that the town really was interested in keeping um, uh, the costs down on a year-to-year -year basis, but what was agreed to was a 2% increase uh, for the three-year period. So a two, two, and two, if you will. Um, the supervisors also asked if, uh, if we could really take a serious look at uh, their job descriptions and make sure that the, what they were doing today was accurately reflected in the uh, job descriptions that, uh, that were part of their jobs. So we spent a lot of time and effort looking at those job descriptions, a lot of hours. Uh, Marie, in particular, spent a tremendous amount of time and effort uh, looking at those job descriptions. We, uh, as you know, as we all know, uh, we compare ourselves to 20 other, 19 other towns. Um, so we looked at the similar individuals within other towns and we wanted to make sure that our supervisors, in terms of what they did, and in comparison to supervisors and comparable individuals in other towns, uh, what those other supervisors were doing. And what we found was that um, there was really a need and a strong uh, argument could be made for some kind of an equity uh, adjustment for those supervisors, which we also agreed to. So there was an equity adjustment uh, in addition to the 2% increase that was agreed to for those three-year periods, or for the three-year period of the, uh, of the contract. A couple of other items that, uh, that uh, we agreed to was uh, an educational uh, allowance, if you will. Uh, of course, the superintendent would have to agree to this, but um, uh, we ask our uh, DPWs to carry different licenses, and they have to spend time uh, to get those licenses and to stay current, and they asked for some, some um, an ability to be able to, to, to recoup some of those costs, if you will, for the hours that they spent. 
Um, and then there was a small item with regard to personal days. Uh, these gentlemen routinely uh, and regularly earn four personal days a year. Uh, under contract they get three, uh, and then there's an additional day that they can earn, and historically they've all learned it uh, over the years that they've been working for us. And um, so we agreed to that as well. Other than that, there were very, very, very few, if any, uh, additional um, adjustments that were made to, uh, to the rank and file contract, which was the blueprint for the DPW supervisor contract. So all in all, it was, a, I, I think, a very, very respectful process. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a great uh, negotiator on the other side of the table from us. That gentleman's in the, uh, in the audience. It's Andy Walsh. Uh, he represents the International Teamsters and uh, an incredible professional. And um, it, was a, it was an excellent experience having an opportunity to sit across from Andy um, and hammer this uh, agreement uh, through. And uh, I think we, uh, uh, we got um, an agreement that we could all agree to and we present to you tonight. Excellent. Thank you very much. Connor. We'd like to thank also um, the town administrator, um, Ted Alexiatis, and uh, uh, ta assistant town administrator, Tom Mayo, uh, for their participation in the negotiation process. It made things move along much faster having them uh, available. And Randy Sylvester, the superintendent of public works, uh, for his time and thoughtful insight into the uh, various issues that we were looking at. Also, David Bassel, the human resources director, for his research and assistance throughout the whole negotiation process. And, uh, and, and as uh, Jack said, the DPW supervisors and Andy. Uh, and both parties, I think, came away feeling that it was a win win. So, for the general public, um, tonight what you have to do is ratify the contract that you've discussed with Jack. And, and re in executive session last week and announce um, you know the board's position on that and and Jack usually you know, the personal board gives a summary as they've done so. okay comments from my colleagues sure. thank you chairman so I, I think um, a couple of things Andy um, you know I, I know this is a new bargaining unit and um, you know obviously uh, you've heard from uh, the personnel board they were very happy with the negotiations with you congratulations to you for, for you know in, in your your outfit I, it's always important to me um, when I, whether they be supervisors or not, but any employee that they're they're happy and that they're treated well, and, and I get the impression that there was a meeting of the minds here, and, and uh, with the proposal that was sent to me, uh, obviously had your support and your, your member support, and, and the board. And I just one other thing I'd like to say is in sitting uh, in this um, uh, executive session, without getting into details, obviously. Uh, to listen to the amount of work with this new bargaining unit that Marie and, and, and uh, Jack put in to this um, this endeavor was a little bit different than from what I've heard in the past in terms of the scope of the work because it really needed a close look and it, and it spent a lot of time and I just want people to know at home that I made note of it then and I make note of it now publicly that we really appreciate all the time that you put into this to make it work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would just um, uh, add that um, I think it was about two years ago when uh, I was watching one of these meetings when something came up and um, and I remember three things that the late Nelson Ross said about a contract and, and I hope I get these right I'm working a little bit off memory um, a fair outcome uh, everybody doesn't get everything that they want but everybody feels like you know we, we've moved forward um, that everybody was listened to and respected and, and my impression from the conversations last week are that that happened. And third and most importantly is that the negotiation strengthens relationships. I think sometimes we think about these negotiations and, and you know, what, what sort of comes to mind is, you know, is two sides of things and clenched fists and, and it doesn't have to be that way. And, and I think that that's a testimony to um, not only the individuals involved in the negotiation, and thank you, um, but also uh, the supervisors and the workforce that's being represented. So um, I look forward to us continuing to strengthen all those different relationships as we move forward. Uh, I won't rehash anything that's been said, um, but I think that the, uh, I call it the highway department, even though it's known as the Department <laughs> of Public Works. Um, I think the work that's done uh, by this department is shown so so clearly in the in the roadways and the parks of our town and you know, just emptying the barrels and the Fourth of July, just myriad of activities. So it, it pleases me greatly that this was collegial and smooth. Um, 
And Jack and Marie, thank you for the continued work that you have done uh, for the town uh, in your service on the personnel board. At this time, I'd entertain a motion to ratify the Department of Public Works Supervisors contract. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, while we're here, we cleaned up the uh, vehicle use policy. I'd like to get that done so the uh, gentleman from the Teamsters can go home. Um, I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the amended vehicle use policy. Those changes have been made. I'm comfortable with them. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you so much, one and all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Next item on the agenda, OPEB discussion. Right. And we have uh, our town accountant and our actuary, Linda Bourneval. I uh, ask you both to come on up. <coughs> you should have a pan hand out in your package. Okay, thank you. Linda will take you through that. Good evening. All right. Good evening, and thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Linda Bourneval. I am an, an actuary, a fellow of the Society of Actuaries. Um, I own my own firm, KMS Actuaries. Uh, we are located in Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, and the town has engaged us to perform biennial valuations every other year. It's required by the GASB to perform every other year valuations. And what that means is we work with the town to collect all the information on your employees and your retirees your health offerings to your retirees, what each retiree contributes on you know, for their own health coverage, what the town contributes, um, and we assess a liability to, the, to that benefit. So I'm gonna really go fast through this presentation. Um, I just basically did the first three slides telling you who I am uh, and what we're gonna talk about. Um, there is kind of like two things going on with OPEB. One is that there are government accounting standard board standards that need to be complied with. That's sort of one of the purposes of the every other year valuation is to prepare financial statement information that would be presented on your financial statements. The other purpose of that valuation is to look at that liability, decide if you wanted to set aside any additional funds into an OPEB trust. And the town has been doing that regularly for the past you know, eight to 10 years. So there are really kind of two purposes. Um, they are kind of separate things to think about as we're, as we're going through this. Um, and I'll kind of you know, point out in, in those areas where we, this is why we're doing the, this this way versus why you do something else. So I am on the fourth slide. Basically, OPEB, the, the, the OPEB a acronym is Other Post-Employment Benefits. It just means anything other than a pension plan. So all of the other, uh, the retirees are currently members of the Hingham Retirement System. That's different, that is not this. This is health insurance, life insurance, anything of that nature that's not a pension. And that's how they came up with the other um, in the terminology. Okay, so anything that isn't that pension plan. Now your teachers, they are not part of the Hingham Retirement System. They are part of Mass Teachers Retirement, again, not included in any of this, but the teachers are included because health insurance is an obligation of the town for your teachers. So if, if anybody was looking at a valuation for this purpose and then side by side was looking at the Hingham retirement valuation, <coughs> they would see a whole lot of different numbers because, the, I mean number of people, because <coughs> the teachers are not included. So that's a, good, a big distinction um, between the two. So when we talk about OPEB, again, if the town offers health insurance, dental, life insurance, um, anything of that nature for retirees, this is a for retiree benefit that we are trying to quantify. Okay, so the current accounting standards basically say <coughs> we've got to disclose information about this plan in our financial statements. We will be disclosing um, the ARC, that's just a terminology on the annual required contribution. I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, there is no standard that is imposed by the GASB, <coughs> excuse me, that says that you must pre-fund this benefit. The town makes contributions on behalf of each retiree because the retirees do not contribute all of the premium. The town contributes a portion and it's based on years of service as of a particular time for different employees. 
Um, the town cannot charge by statute any more than 50% of the cost of that health insurance. But there is no statute that says you must pre-fund this benefit. The way there is statute on retirement where you must pre-fund according to section or chapter 32 of Mass General Laws, these benefits are, um, the statute is chapter 32B, but there's nothing at this point by any legislative body that <clears throat> requires pre-funding. So that really is kept at the local level and it's a decision that would be made by the governing body here. All right. So just a little bit, little note about the future. So uh, the, the current status of GASB 45, the, the life is pretty short. Um, it was effective in fiscal 09 and it will be ending in fiscal 18 when it will be replaced. You know GASB made a big change when they actually replace it. They don't just amend it. They are replacing GASB 45 with GASB 75. And that will mean, again, not anything to do with funding, but everything to do with your financial statement disclosures, that the biggest change of this statement is that you will be putting on the balance sheet the actual unfunded liability. Before it was a cum an accumulation of the difference between what we thought you should fund and what was funded. It was every year you'd calculate that gap. Now. It's sort of a fresh start at the beginning of, or for fiscal 18, it will be the full unfunded liability. So at this point, we've got about $65 million of unfunded liability. That will actually appear on the balance sheet. So that is a, a big departure. If you've been following along and are, quote, a good student, or were a good student of pension accounting, that just happened in FY15, in, in fiscal 15, the full unfunded liability of the retirement system was placed on the balance sheet. This same change really is, is very, very comparable. The GASB kind of realigned retirement and then they said, okay, let's now go do the same thing on OPEB. And really, if you look through the GASB 75 standard and the um, GASB 68, 67, 68 on retirement, they're almost identical except for the word OPEB and retirement. So they really are quite close. So what we do every other year, we prepare an actuarial evaluation. As I mentioned, we get, in, we get retiree data, <coughs> data, rates that are currently in place on your retirement, um, sorry, on your medical plans. Um, we put all that into a model. We have to make certain assumptions about the future. The most important one being the, time, the um, discount rate used to discount those benefits back to the present. Uh, that is the rate that we are assuming actually on our long-term investments and at this point it's seven and a half percent Same as the retirement system um, I am on if you're following along slide eight <coughs> so Kind of already talked a little bit about GASB 45 that there are certain compliance standards that we follow uh, the actuarial standards of practice dictate how we are to develop these liabilities. The GASB statements themselves tell us how to calculate once we have the liabilities, how to calculate the items needed on the financial statements. Again, no, um, there is no, I want to say, uh, statute or anything under GASB that's going to tell us how to fund, pre-fund pre any of these benefits. Um, I show on the next slide just a comparison of your census information. These are the, the, em the employees and retirees that we are looking at, that we're actually valuing. We collect employees, all employees, including teachers, um, and project to the future whether or not they're actually going to collect and receive this coverage. Um, so all, all employees are included in the valuation as well as all, all retirees who are currently covered under some kind of health insurance. Um, and it would include, if a retiree has elected spouse coverage, it will include their spouses as well. Um, plan provisions, it's really, usually there's two sets of health, co health coverage <coughs> that you can elect. When you are under 65, you are on the town's plans, whatever the town employees are covered under. Your pre-65 retirees are also included in that group. Uh, once you hit Medicare eligibility and you are eligible for Medicare, it's a Medicare supplemental plan. The cost of those plans is much lower because of um, Medicare will be primary provider. 
Um, some people look at the liabilities between the pre-Medicare and post, and sometimes the post-Medicare liabilities can be much larger. And that's because the period of time over which they're paid is much longer. You could have a 65-year-old live till you know, 85, 95, 100. So we would be paying out benefits or um, having, they would be covered for a very long period of time. The pre-Medicare group, if you have a age 63 retiree, they're only really in that plan for a couple of years, but those plans are a bit more expensive. The retirees contribute between 10 and 50 percent. That's depending on um, the group that they're in, whether they're town employees versus teachers and the teachers and administrators, their years of service at a particular point in time. Uh, they're all, I guess we call it grandfathered. If you had had 30 years of service as of uh, 2009, you will only be contributing 10%. But that was a fixed period of time. There are certain retirees that are contributing 10, certain that are contributing 20, 30, 40. Just if I could just clarify for that point, um, Linda, that um, for the town in 2009, we um, negotiated with the teachers to pull the, re the, re the retired teachers out of the group insurance <laughs> commission. At the time, they were earning a 90% benefit. The town agreed through a trust agreement between the active teachers, because you can't negotiate with the retired teachers, they're not a bargaining group, and we created a trust vehicle that um, kept all the existing retired teachers at 90% for retirement health benefits uh, for the remainder of their life and grandfathered in a segment of uh, the school teacher population so that we wouldn't see people rushing for the doors. So if there was over, if you had over 30 years of service at that date, you got the 90% benefit whenever you retired. If you had over 25 and 20 years, so we stratified that. That is the only group. Every other group in town receives 50% health care benefits and there's no stratification of years of service or anything like that. So I didn't want uh, to get any confusion on that point. Thanks so. for clarifying that. So that's one of the pieces we look at, your plan. And that's controlled by your negotiations and, and how the town is structuring the, the benefit itself. Um, that's, next we have to um, select a bunch of assumptions. I talked about the discount rate. There's a gamut of discount rates that can be used and obviously being the most important assumption because changes in the discount rate can affect liabilities significantly. If there was no pre-funding of assets to pay for future benefits under this program, we would anticipate that all benefits are being paid out of the town general fund. And that rate of return is very low. So let's be close to the rate of return on cash. Our kind of policy has been, and this is I think um, kind of an industry standard, that that's like three and a half to four percent. I know that does not sound like a rate of return you'd get on cash, but under OPEB it sort of has been, again, has to be a long-term perspective. It's not just this year's anticipated rate of return. So we start with that discount rate and we say, okay, for no pre-funding we're going to be around four percent, but for full pre-funding meaning you would be funding an actuarially determined contribution, you would look at your underlying assets that are being set aside for the purpose of funding these benefits and say, okay, we've got an investment policy, that fund is invested in, in a combination of stocks and bonds and other you know, more risky investments. Um, so we have been using the full investment return. So if you look at the chart on page 11, it kind of gives you the full pre-funding um, option under the discount rate. Um, the, the OPEB trust, however, does have very specific um, criteria. To be an OPEB trust, you must be um, using those assets set aside strictly for retiree benefits, retiree medical benefits. You must um, also, they also have to be irrevocable. All contributions are irrevocable. Once they're in the trust, that's it. They're there for, for the duration of the program and to, again, pay off these benefits. So there are some criteria. There are other assumptions I won't go through. They're all very detailed in our report in Section 7. Healthcare trend rates. What do we, how do we think this thing's going to you know, trend? How, how are health insurance premiums going to trend in the future? We've got participation rates. We, you know, not every retiree will elect this coverage. Not every retiree will elect a spouse. All of those assumptions are detailed in our full report in Section 7, along with probability or decrement rates, we call them, on probabilities of retirement and turnover and death. Those are all, all um, detailed in that section. Um, 
slide 14, just a comparison of last time's re report to this time's report. There are a lot of changes that have occurred over the past couple of years in our actuarial standards of practice. Every OPEB valuation, you know, throughout the country, as well as every retirement system um, valuation has been kind of under close scrutiny and you know, a lot of, you know, outsiders have provided a lot of influence on what we are going to use to make sure that our assumptions are reasonable. Um, so one of the key um, areas that everybody's looking at is mortality rates, that people really are living longer, that if we do not anticipate the fact that people are living longer, we are undervaluing these liabilities. So we need to make sure that we account for mortality improvement, which means that a 25-year-old today is actually going to have a longer life expectancy starting at age 65 than a 65-year-old today. So the generations are improving every year. Easiest way to explain that. So all of that is built into this. Those don't come without a cost. And, and so, you know, longer life expectancies are going to mean that our liabilities are going to be increased. May I just pause on that just on this slide 14 if if I'm reading this correctly and this this may also help for the audience and, and the press so that as of June 30th 2016 our total town OPEB liability is just under 76 million dollars correct and that we've already saved because we've been contributing to OPEB for the last seven eight years we've already saved 10 million dollars so our unfunded liability is about 65 66 million so is that correct that's exactly correct okay yes is i it? just i just thought for the purposes of this conversation it's sure. helpful especially for the audience who doesn't have the benefits so we have a our, our pension liability is 66 million dollars and so i thank you if you also look on this chart, there's another very interesting number here, and maybe you could just spend a minute of time talking about this. It's the normal cost that went from 1,323 to 1.5 million. So if we had a fully funded system, what would we need to appropriate every year to manage our system? So the normal cost is, is the value of benefits earned every year. Every time somebody works another minute, they are earning a new benefit. So that's the normal cost. If the system were fully funded, fully funded does not mean that at the end of the day you're, you're paying zero. You're still always going to be paying for these new benefits that are earned. The, the unfunded liability is really about the past. It's the fact that you haven't funded since the beginning of time yep. and accumulated enough assets to cover what has been earned to date. So, so, so there's always a future, if you will. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of a comparison here. Please. So this year in your budget, you um, haven't yet voted, but I do hope that you will vote, uh, a $6.863 million health care budget. If you had a fully funded OPEB system today, so if we had $65 million in the bank that we could immediately allocate to that, your health care cost for the town would be $1,578,000 you know, a five to six million dollar swing when you get to that point in time. Yeah. Now, per the schedule, it's 40, uh, 35 years from now, so. We also are this year contributing about, eight, you, you have your budget book out, Teb, it's, it's like $800,000 is what we're, we're so budgeting the, for OPEB. Correct. So we're on a funding schedule that I think gets us there in 28? 28 years? 30, yeah, it was 30 years. Yep. So 2040. Years yeah. 2040 is our, our year. One thing to keep in mind is that if, if you set aside money in the OPEB trust, even if you sent, if you did not, you're still funding this benefit because you're paying the town's portion of the, impl of the health care. That pay as you okay. go. So if we computed a, cal you know, a contribution, yeah. the arc of $5 million, and your health care costs are going to be three million for the retirees, that, that gap, the two million dollars is what you would, you know, technically to fully fund the ARC, you'd be putting into the, the OPEP trust. I think the essence of this is that when we look at our operating budget and we realize that we have about five or six million dollars in there that we call health care, but what it really is is long-term debt. Mm -hmm. Because we never, we made promises 
for about 60 years that we would pay for health care and we never set those monies aside and then people retired and then that number grew. So. I think it's just also important to note that as a community and I know this board and previous boards and you know Ted's led the charge on this but you know we view this as this is our responsibility. People have worked for the town and with the commitment that we would provide their health care upon retirement and and I think we all feel pretty strongly that um, we need to honor that commitment. I think there are going to be other com other communities and other states that are going to have difficulty honoring a lot of those commitments, but what we're talking about is making sure that we're not one of them. Exactly. <laughs> On slide 16, I just kind of show a comparison between the ARC. Now the ARC is just, it's GASBY accounting terminology and annual required contribution, again, there is a split between any required funding. That is still, the GASBY still recognizes that that is a, a, you know, it's up to the local legislative bodies to make those decisions, but they call it the annual required contribution. I said out of the three words, there's only one that's actually correct, and that's annual. It's an annual number. It's not required. It's not really a contribution, but it's just the terminology that's used. Um, and that's how we can come up with sort of an, a, a sound actuarial um, contribution. It is paying for that normal cost, the cost of earning a new, a new benefit in the year. That's always going to be there. It's always going to be a part of the annual required contribution. But you also need to come up with some kind of funding mechanism or some kind of funding policy, if you will, to pay off that past, pay off the past unfunded liability. So we've we established a 30-year amortization of that unfunded liability several years ago. Every other year we chop off two years. We're now up to 24 years. Um, but because this year there were so many changes that we needed to make, one being the mortality improvement that does increase liabilities, we kind of hit a reset. We said, you know what, let's keep paying off the mortgage like we were under the old, all the old mortgage, but let's kind of call this like a, a refinance of there are new liabilities that were sort of generated in this valuation and we tried to establish a new, if you will, mortgage to pay off that piece. So we kind of split it all up into many components and you'll see the details of that in the, in the valuation report. So earlier in the budget when we talked about, and I, I, I made you aware that the OPEB numbers, uh, if there was an annual required contribution, um, it would now be much more than it had been in the past because of these plan assumptions and changes. Um, we've uh, had six valuations in the last um, three, uh, uh, three valuations in the last six years. Sorry, I said it backwards. Um, and um, if I drew a data point, I would say that um, the first one took the valuation up like that, and then the second one brought it down like that, and the third one brought it up like that. And each of those swings are several million dollars. Um, or a million dollars in this case. Um, we fund our operations through tax dollars and um, we are a service organization of which 80% of our money is really in, in payroll. Um, you know, to, to squeeze a million dollars out of the operating budget for something that's changing so rapidly over such a short period of time, um, I, I, that my advice to you is not to do that at this point in time and stay with your current trends until you see the effects of what happened in the GIC, which is a tremendous um, negative, uh, uh, decreasing assumption or a gain, so to speak, because it'll lower our costs and lower all our liabilities accordingly. Um, and my guess is we're going to see another um, GASB change in two to four years, is my guess. Another change in the mortality tables um, or something along those lines as we keep three mortality changes in 12 <coughs> years. Right. So. So usually the most um, I guess the slide and the part of the report that generates the most interest is slide 17 and that's how did we get to you know a 65 million dollar unfunded liability. Gee last valuation we were only at 50 million dollars so there are a whole lot of things that happen. Two years of experience you know you might have people um, <coughs> living longer. Earlier retirements will create actuarial losses that and that that's because this benefit is not really age-based or service-based. We have cer certain assumptions. We think police and fire may retire, you know, at age 60, maybe 62. Well, if somebody does retire at 55, this 
that would create an actuarial loss. And that's because the benefit is the benefit. It's the health insurance premium. It's not like a retirement benefit that people say, you know what, I want to work five more years so I, I can get five more years of service that goes to my retirement system benefit. This is a little bit different. It's much more volatile than a retirement system benefit, which that's the reason why we come up with these you know, funding numbers that kind of are all over the place because the the basic benefit that we're trying to value, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> is really hard to pinpoint. It's not like retirement where it's a salary service-based benefit. You can control the salary. We know how many years people are going to work and we multiply it all out. Where the health insurance, we're waiting every other year or every year for the health premium you know, renewal rates to come out and we adjust. We've got to change our valuation to adjust more recent you know, reflect the more recent retire, uh, healthcare rate. So that's really what drives these liabilities is the volatility of that health insurance <coughs> premium. I would also just add as, as someone who also sat on the advisory committee that a lot of the discussions around the advisory committee table over the past several years have also been that a discount rate of seven and a half percent is, um, uh, you know, understand we have that for the pension as well. Um, uh, you know that that's a little ambitious, um, and and we also have to be mindful that, um, well, perhaps in the last couple of years that that's been realized, that in a few years um, our OPEB liability could change because of those assumptions as well, and and I've, as you said earlier, that change in the discount rate has a really big impact on the number, um, and and I believe that other communities are everybody's kind of budgeting seven and a half percent. I keep hearing seven and a half percent, but I just want to make one correction. We're at seven and three quarters. Okay, seven percent. and three quarters. For both the pension you. and the OPEP system. Um, and this is um, a change uh, from a number of years ago when we were at eight yeah. percent. When I say a number of years ago, I actually mean a, a very few number of years ago, like two was it or three? I think we changed think it in 2014. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as a plan. Uh, in 2014, when we looked at it, we thought of seven and a half or seven because we, we're hearing that and we're seeing the same things. But I think in the same vein here, where we're not going to just jump up to the new appropriation, just like we didn't do the five year or 10 year snow and ice average, um, we're going to move steadily up on this. Because if we were to drop from eight to seven, um, we, we'd probably drop several million dollars at the bottom line here of an expense, which would mean layoffs in our organization or dipping into our reserves, which hasn't been our practice. So um, I asked the retirement board this year and Sue to look for the OPEB about doing some sensitivity analysis about what it would be to lower this steadily over the next several budget cycles and, and, and give us range of magnitude so we can understand if we see some budget flexibility a year or two out, maybe we say, okay, that's the year you, you, know, you, you lower your discount rate and, and become a little more conservative. Quick question on page 17 there. Because I don't, the implicit subsidy, just explain that. Sure, Ken. <clears throat> That's usually the question that comes up. So, in the past, when <clears throat> um, our actual standard, standard of practice, as well as GASB, would allow us to value the premium rates, which is what we did. There are some communities that were not allowed to value the premium rates, and I'll have to describe the difference and why that's the case. When health insurance rates are developed by Minuteman or whoever, even the GIC, <clears throat> they are blending a whole lot of people into a pool. And when you have your active employees mixed with your retirees, you've got 22-year-old active employees whose health care costs we know. Not, not thinking about the premium that's charged, but we know the cost of that 22-year-old is a lot different than the 62-year-old retiree. So, if you imagine health care costs are on a increasing slope of reality versus the blended rate that is charged for every retiree and every active employee, the retirees are actually being subsidized by the active employees in reality. All right. For budget purposes, it's all... That's how insurance yeah. works. Yeah, and that's, that's really what it is. The pool, right? It's a pool. So GASB allowed and the actual standards of practice allowed what they called community rated plans and that's what this is. If you get to a program that's big enough like Minuteman or the GIC where the number of retirees in Hingham is not going to push the needle on that blended rate at all, right? They said, okay, 
these retirees aren't going to aren't going to matter in terms of calculating the cost of that blended rate. So we'll allow you to value just the premium, and we've been doing that for several years for a lot of communities. The actual standards of practice changed over the past couple of years that said, note that really isn't right. That we really do need to value the cost of this of this benefit and the cost really is that a 62 year old is here versus like the 22 year old that's down here so we're not valuing this premium anymore <coughs> kind of shifted but guess what the active 22 year old isn't quite in our valuation yet he's not being it's not covered yet we anticipate he could be covered but it really now is this cost that's affiliated or associated with all those retirees who are, by the way, just those retirees in the active plans. All right, so that has created a lot of angst and a lot of, oh great, so now we just spent five years explaining that you got a break on this implicit subsidy, now we kind of have to flip. The GASB's <coughs> position is that you must follow the actuarial standards of practice in valuing healthcare costs. And that is, that really is what the healthcare cost is. It does put all communities now kind of on the same, you know, when we're trying to compare from, or people compare from community to community. The benefits aren't the same. There aren't, there are some towns that don't um, charge, you know, 10% only to the retirees. Others charge 10% for everybody. So we're still not on a totally even playing field, but at least the concept and the methods that we're using to value those costs are the same. So that, that's a, kind of in there now. This and you would characterize subsidy. that as a very significant change? I would, yes. That is a pretty significant um, change from the methods we were using. Um, it was you know, <coughs> talked about a lot. Um, a lot of people are, are saying, <coughs> you know, it, it kind of is the way we've kind of got to do it. Um, I think once GASB 75 comes into place, there's going to be a lot more scrutiny on these numbers because of the pretty big impact on the financial statements that's going to occur. So these are in there. These lo these this implicit subsidy is now in the calculation of the liability. So um, not not to be funny, but in lay layman's terms, what is the the net effect of that change so in terms of ten million dollars on our liability? Oh, no. Yeah. So that's as much exactly what huge it's swing. I mean, it's a yeah. And and it's um, and it has to get its effect felt across all of the ten thousand cities and towns in the United States of America. Right. Um, so again, it goes back to my idea that it's a substantial change, extremely significant. Three mortality changes in the past decade and a half. I'm not sure we have our hands on this yet. I'm not saying the actuaries don't. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to. <laughs> But I'm just not sure that we have all the rules established on how we're going to value these things going forward. And the numbers are bouncing. And until we get some stability in that liability, I don't see you changing your, I mean, continue to allocate our money to it. You know, continue to build up our reserves. Because we know you're going to have, you know there's a liability less than zero. But I don't know if it's growing as quite as fast as it's being projected. Um, we are premium based, even though we <coughs> belong to an organization that could eventually charge us. Essentially, we're premium based here. So we don't have the the um, some of those issues, but I, I think there's more to come on this over the next few years. You'll be talking about OPEB regularly now. Well, it also says that we need to stay the core. I mean, that we need to Absolutely. continue to make the contributions. The fact that you know we're sitting here with ten million dollars already set aside for our OPEB liability. I think we are one of the first communities in the Commonwealth to start. Um, and uh, you know, I think this year when there's budget pressure, sometimes you know there's there's looking to do we have to do this? Do we have to do that? What I take away from this is that is that that OPEB number can't get lower this year because there's potential that it's going to get higher in future years. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I asked uh, Linda also to give you some comments on what other communities are doing because. Uh, you, you sort of raised that, and I'd asked her earlier to do that, because you are you extremely unique, one of a handful of communities. Yeah, I actually talk about you guys on the, I have one client who actually contributes the ARC, <laughs> close to the ARC. Um, others, there are many who are contributing nothing. It is a accounting exercise. They are paying their monthly bills to provide the coverage, but they're really not setting aside any any additional funds into an OPEB trust. The OPEB trust 
talk is really over the past, I'd say, 12 months. I've had more calls on, can you come and talk to us about a trust? What is that going to mean? Um, you know, one of the things it means on the liability side is that you get to use a higher discount rate. And I'm going to just touch on the discount rate in a second. So what you have is a, a large spread of funding nothing, funding the ARC. Some will say we're going to um, come up with a policy that is some contribution percentage of the free cash that's available. Some say, oh no, we're going to do 250000 a year for the rest of the life of this thing, and that's what we'll show them in a forecast. Here's what 250 a year does for you. Or, you know, we've budgeted $300,000 this year. We want that to increase by 3% a year forever. Show us what that looks like. So we do a lot of the funding forecasts like we show in our Section 4 of our report with here's what happens if you fund and can you pay this thing off in 30 years or are you forever um, sort of just chasing, you know, you're putting in a little bit of money and you're still doing what you're supposed to do and that is funding the benefit with pay as you go, but also, you know, what can you put aside to take care of that full unfunded liability on the, on the outside. Well, most towns are just so. not catching up to that liability yeah. and at the end of the day, as you, you heard from the implicit subsidy, you, you, the retiree portion of your health care budget is going to grow faster than the, the active health care portion of your budget because that's where the health care costs are actually being spent. We know that more than anecdotally that we spend more money in our later years than we spend in our earlier years. Um, and I, I do have a great fear for what's going to happen to the communities in the Commonwealth that are just not funding this. Eventually, they're going to get to a point where they have a budget crisis and they can't, pay for, they can't afford to pay for retiree health care. And um, I do believe there is no requirement under Mass General Law that we pay for retiree health care. And towns are going to be forced into making some very, very difficult choices that they hadn't uh, thought of if they don't do the things that you're doing. And just to put in perspective, when, when I was on advisory we, and, and OPEB was starting, um, the projection was that if we didn't start saving for this, that over time it would get to be such a big liability that it would account for 25% 25 25 of, of the operating budget. So imagine, you know, that health care line right now is what, like seven? Seven million. Imagine 25. Yep. So again, that's why, you know, you set it aside, the time value of money. Um, and, and you manage your benefits. Yep. And that brings me right to two slides that kind of go together, <laughs> my controlling costs versus controlling liabilities. <laughs> So the, co <coughs> the costs are really like in your hands. It's what you're going to be paying out of the budget for your health care. Moving to the GIC, um, anticipating lower premium increases every year from being in the GIC. Again, anticipating might not always come true. But those are the items that are sort of like in your control. Then there's the liability side of it where if you pre-fund, it gives you a an opportunity to increase your discount rate. And again, that discount rate, back to my swinging around, back to the discount rate, it really is supposed to be a long-term perspective. I mean, years ago, if you looked at retirement funding and we were, you know, at 9 or 9%, 9 I think people were complaining that it was too low, right? The markets were crazy. So now when things have shifted and everyone's saying, well, we, we kind of all moved to 8 and now on retirement side, the pressure is on to bring that down. I think the state just adopted a 7.5% investment return rate. That's for funds invested at PRIT. Yes, over the past couple of years, they have not returned anywhere near a 7.5% return. But again, we're looking at this over a very long time horizon. You've got a 20-year-old employee that we're trying to predict when he retires, he or she, you know, 40 years from now, what that benefit's going to be, and he may live for 40 more years. We're discounting that, you know, 100 years or so out into the future, back to the present. So it is really a long-term um, assumption, not, not so much to be focused on short-term. We're trying to get the investment consultants to really focus on that kind of thing. They're very good about providing all the historical information and what the returns have been. Um, but now, especially with the new GASB rules, they need to provide for us a justification of a long-term outlook. And that might be, how is this investment policy 
um, you know, put together what's the target allocation of this $10 million, we will be pressing them to actually help us come up with the investment return rate. Um, so the discount rate being a very important assumption, under GASB 75, it all goes away. Our, I guess, ability to choose based on some conceptual, um, you're funding the R, kind of, we can do that at seven and three quarters. Now what GASB, and again, this is financial reporting, not your funding policy, but for financial reporting, the discount rate that can be used is how many years of benefit payments do you have in your trust that we can that discount at seven and three quarters, and then will you run out of money on a current funding policy, and when you do, we now have to go to the 20-year high-quality municipal bond rate. That's 3.85% as of last week. All right, so those, it's gonna be really easy to do these valuations for the ones who are pre-funding zero. It's 3.85, and that's what it would be if we were to do this today. All right, so that bond rate kind of has been a little volatile over the past couple years. It was in the low fours probably about a year and a half ago. It dipped into the twos. Now it's about, you know, it's in the threes now. That is going to be the driver of these liabilities. So when GASB 75, and, you know, you read these things about the trillions of dollars of unfunded OPEB liabilities, just wait till that GASB comes into play. So our discount rate is probably going to be lowered here. And if our discount rate is lowered, then our liabilities grow and our annual requirement goes. So right. again, if I had come to you and said, you know, new numbers show you should throw another 400,000 or 600,000 in, it's very likely I could have the same conversation with you in two years and say, all right, now it's another million. And you're chasing something that um, I don't know how realistic you can do. Right. And that brings up on the discount rate, again, for funding, we don't have to follow the GASB rules. So if you wanted to see a funding, and that's why we always show the full funding, we show another model so that you can see, and you could pick any discount rate or investment return rate that you would, you'd wanna see and say, okay, we're gonna like fund at this rate, and maybe we don't even fund for the implicit subsidy, because it's not something that's coming out of, the po out of your pocket. You're still paying blended premium rates. So there are some communities that actually do two valuations. They may do one for strictly funding, and then do another one for the GASB financial statement requirements. So those are the kind of models we can put together quite easily because once we have all the data, you just, you know, it's really you change the discount rate and maybe change the change back to premiums and say, let's fund on what I call a more real, it's more realistic in terms of budgeting. So there are some of those opportunities to, um, you know, build some models and, and decide how you might want to fund it. All right, and that kind of should have printed a big paper. <laughs> It'll be a quiz tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be absent. Thank you very much. Ask Ted any questions you might have. Yeah, Brian, about the <laughs> We're really lucky that we have a partner of your capability in this. Thank right. you. Thank you. Great learning experience. And for the board to know, um, Linda has worked with us in some capacity or another for um, about 25 years now. Um, she worked for another a number of other firms before she started her own firm, and we uh, joined her. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> well, we're a little over time, but time well spent nonetheless. Next item on the agenda is entitled Dog Leashing and Alternatives Discussion. So I turn to either one of my colleagues to uh, speak to this. Um, maybe I so. could give you an overview, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Tom's been working on this um, diligently along with myself. Um, we received a petition article for um, uh, asking for a special act to um, go to the state legislature to um, uh, essentially change the decision of the, of the board um, to require um, uh, leashes on all dogs in the park. Um, I met with uh, one of the proponents um, and um, suggested that um, 
if possible, I would come to the board and ask the board to submit an article um, instead of uh, a petition article for a couple of reasons. One, the special act, um, it was um, concluded by me and town council and we communicated it to, to the citizens that um, it was likely not going to survive um, to meet the goals that they wanted. Um, you know, not regardless of whether it got out of town meeting or not, just the legislative process was going to be very long and very arduous. and and. Um, John Coughlin had some serious thoughts as to whether the AG would even consider it legal to go forward. So <clears throat> I, I met with them and I suggested that, you know, if the reason is to get the town meeting, I would approach the selectmen and ask if they were interested in um, including two articles that address the issues that the group wanted to address at town meeting. You could include these articles on the warrant. You do not have to endorse them if you don't feel like you have to or you can. But um, it, it allowed them to get access to the legislative process. Uh, I thought it was um, not, not a good governmental practice to, to allow them to go through a process that might ultimately provide a lot of frustration and, and no results. Um, uh, but again, there's plenty of time, and I wanted to get this up on the table now. And if you don't want to go the way of the petition article, or you want to, that's certainly capable. Um, they, they certainly have time to get that done. But if you're in willing to consider um, uh, an article on town meeting. We've given you those two articles and Tom has worked directly with, um, I, I believe it's um, Ms. Sutton, on, on those two articles. So if I may just briefly. Um, <coughs> so Ted, I just, you and I had talked about this not too long ago. I talked to John Coughlin prior to our conversation and as we discussed, I spoke to him after our conversation. And he reaff reaffirmed to me that it is not an AG issue uh, if it gets up to the legislature under the special act scenario. It would be if you were just trying to reverse the Board of Selectmen's vote. So he's told me that twice, once before and once after you raised the issue. So I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong, so to speak, but I think people at home should know that th that may not be the case. And, and, and I know we're working cooperatively here, but I just want people to know that, and, and I, just for the record, didn't agree that it would be such an arduous uh, journey through the legislature if, if the town of Hingham voted at a town meeting that they wanted something done. But I guess we, wouldn't, we, we would have to wait and see what happens. But uh, it's done um, many times in terms of home rule petitions and special acts. It, it isn't necessarily Hingham's practice. We did it last year, I think. <clears throat> but in, I just wanted more for clarification. I think that we're here tonight to discuss something. And I want to thank Ted and Tom for working with uh, the folks in town to come up with some type of language, and John Coughlin as well. Uh, John did a great job in trying to come up with some p potential language, and I, I would defer to my colleagues and, and to anybody in the audience that wants to speak on, on the issue, and I would maybe have some comments at the end. So, um, uh, yeah, I wanted to, um, um, I'm really glad we're talking about this tonight for lots of different reasons. And I think a lot of us have wanted to talk about this. Um, I'm just going to start out and say that, um, you know, we, we took a vote in here a couple of months ago, and um, not an easy vote. And um, uh, a couple days after we took that vote, I actually, uh, uh, Katie Sutton, one of one of the proponents for, um, uh, or I would say, a citizen who didn't like the decision the board made, or didn't agree with it, um, approached me, and I think we spent about two and a half hours um, talking about this. And you know, kind of what I said to Katie at the time was, "Look, um, the other night I made a decision that I thought was appropriate for the town, and I understand that that there are some people that agreed with that decision and others who didn't." And she kind of came to me and said, okay, how, like, and I'm going to use like layperson terms here. How, how do we appeal this? Like, if we don't like this, what do we do with it? And uh, what I said to her then, and I've said to her all along is, look, while I, in my role, made that decision, I understand that now my role has shifted a little bit. And my role is that we have some citizens who feel disaffected and they want to know what the process is for appealing something. And so we talked about the process, which in most cases is, well, we're going to go to town meeting. Because as we all know, town meeting is the ultimate legislative body in this town. And um, I assured Katie, and I know that both my colleagues would have done that in the same, had they been in, in the situation, that um, 
we would work cooperatively with people who want to bring something forward to town meeting because that's our job. Our job is to make the government accessible to people. So we kind of go along this journey and we find out that this is actually not an issue that town meeting, town meeting has no authority over this decision. And so the selectman's decision would sort of stand, which is what then led to the possibility of a special act. And again, the town has, as we do with every petition article, we've worked with people to come up with language to make sure that, that whatever comes before town meeting and ultimately the state is meets your goal. So we come to find out that this would require a special act and what that would mean is that it would require town meeting approval and then the legislature. And you know, I, I'm not as familiar not being a lawyer here. Um, Katie's a lawyer, you guys are lawyers. I would just say that what we would be doing is putting this decision, it's another layer. It, it could get, you know, whether or not it would be successful, we don't know. But what I do know is if we would ever want to change it in any way, we would have to go back that same route. And it, you know, so it, I would just say it gets more complicated. Um, I appreciate that Ted, what Ted's done is he's identified an alternative. And the, the best way to describe this alternative is that it would be a warrant article and I would stress that it's, um, it's not a binding article. It doesn't direct the selectmen. It authorizes the selectmen. But in a sense, if we were to submit this article, what we would be doing is we'd say, town meeting, you get our vote on this issue. That's what it would be saying. So, you know, you remember the original this vote. Board. This board. Right. It would be saying, and, and that's in effect, that's the way I view this article. And it would say that we would take a proposal to share the park to town meeting. And if town meeting said, we're going to go with this, what, what this article in a sense says to me is that in my role, I would be saying, well, I personally support the decision I made in October, that if town meeting wants a different decision, I'm willing to give town meeting my vote. And that, that's what it's going to be doing for all of us. So when this came up, and, and Katie and Tom and I have met a couple of times, I think once in November, once in December, um, and I've thought about this a, lo a lot in the last week or so. And um, so, so what it would mean, it would mean we'd go to town meeting and there would be a Warren article. Now, it would be submitted by the Board of Selectmen, but that doesn't mean that the selectmen are endorsing it. It's the way, the way again, I view this in layperson's terms is this is a courtesy that the Board is extending to some citizens to allow their issue to be heard on the floor of town meeting. And that avoids having to go through a special act. In my opinion, if town meeting were to rule on something and it gets, goes through the special act process and somehow it, it doesn't get acted on, I can see where that would re be really disaffecting. You know, if, like for example, the TA bylaw that we just did, imagine if we had gone through and done the TA bylaw, thumbs up from everybody, thumbs up from town meeting, sits in committee and it expires. You know, we, we'd all feel bad about that. And, and I think as we're looking at government, we have to set, I think part of my role is to look at the process as well as the issue. And I think it's really important that we not we not have a circumstance where people are disaffected, if at all possible. So, so the way this would sort of work, if we submitted the Warren article, is that the citizen group, and, and we've talked to them about this, would go through the hearing process. So we would not be advocating for this article. Uh, as a matter of fact, we'd hear it, and I've, I've, said, I've, I've said to the proponents, I probably won't support it, I'll keep an open mind, but I don't, I don't know that I'll change my mind. But what I would commit is that if this article goes forward and town meeting says, we'd rather you do it this way, I will abide by town meeting's wishes. Because in my mind, town meeting's the big decision maker here. So, so that's kind of what this, what this article is about. Um, and we've talked to the Bear Cove Park Committee and we've made the Bear Cove Park Committee aware of this because that's important to do. 
and um, I think um, as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking that again, uh, my, my sense is that even if we don't do this, you're going to go to town meeting with a special act. This is going to be talked about at town meeting, and and which is totally within your right to do as citizens. So we're going to talk about this one way or the other. To me, the benefit of a selectman warrant article is that it it the wishes of town meeting would be carried out here here Not in Boston and and that there isn't the risk that you know I, I frankly as, as I was thinking about this the um, the bottom line for me is you know that you know in some ways the easier thing is to say special act go go do it that doesn't feel right to me um, and while I don't necessarily support what you are putting forward, I think in this case, I have a job to do as an elected official, which is to make sure that our government is working for people. And I think this is a little bit of an unusual situation. In a lot of cases, and like nearly everything we do, you don't like it, there's an appeal, which is town meeting. I think just about on everything, there is. This one is a little bit of an outlier. And so I don't see myself doing this for other things. But, uh, but on this one, I, I think there's this kind of a, a, a technicality that says that, um, th that makes it a little bit different. And um, from, from what I understand, the, the, the proposed warrant article would involve an odd even leash off leash We've worked with council to draft language for an article. There would be some supplementary documents that would go along with the article, including some regulations that we will have to fine tune in the next week. One of the other advantages of the board doing this is that um, a petition article is locked in. As soon as we get the petition with the 10 signatures, you can't change a period, a comma, a word. The selectman can change articles as it goes forward if it turns out that the article needs to have rules and regulations or, or something that you want to work in that. And I know Katie and Tom are working on that. We're working today on that and likely will continue working on that. And, and let me just add something on that because um, I, I recognize that there are a number of people who are pretty disaffected. And what, what we're asking you to do here is to take a leap of faith with this board. And you know what I'll tell you is that um, while the selectmen would have the ability to adjust the Warren article, um, I would only do that if there was a legal infirmity, or if there was something that was not clear. So you know, I, you know, I have no intention, for example, of saying, oh, instead of every other day, I'm going to change it to uh, every Thursday. Um, I, my job in this, if we go ahead with this. My job is to put your work in front of town meeting in a way that it's actionable by town meeting. I have no intention or desire to modify the scope of it because of my own personal view. I've sort of taken that hat off and I'm putting on my government hat. So I, I wouldn't see myself making any modifications to this warrant article that we're not in keeping with the spirit of what your group is looking for. And, you know, from my advisory days, I would tell you that there have been times when a warrant article has to be adjusted, and that is always done in conjunction with whoever brings it forward. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that would, that would certainly be the case. Um, so, you know, Paul, I know before this came up, you know, you were, I think you and I were both kind of searching for some different things. I know you were thinking about a committee. I was thinking about, you know, a, a dog park, which I think I've gotten some feedback, at least from this group, that that's, that's, not, that's not a remedy for, for, for this circumstance. You know, what, what I might suggest for, for kind of both of us, where we have some different ideas, I'd almost suggest that if we do this, 
let's let this go forward without any other any other noise around it you know so this is me putting my dark dog park on hold um, you putting the idea of the committee because I think in this part of our job is as with, as it is with any article is is to give it the ability to kind of go through the town meeting process so you know I wouldn't be averse to exploring other options after town meeting um, you know I mean I, I just I guess what I'm saying is let's let's let this play through I think we have a, a citizen group who is engaged who is mobilized who has had a lot of vigorous discussion um, about what they want to put forward and um, I'd, I'd feel comfortable letting them put that forward um, at, th at this point in time. You want me to res respond? Okay. I was going to defer to my chairman, but just um, I, I spoke to Tom actually before the meeting and I've spoken to, to many residents who are interested in, and I obviously my purpose was to get a dialogue going on this in terms of, um, you know, obviously I didn't vote for the regulation um, and so I'm supportive of some type of compromise. I've always said that those are the two things I wanted to see and uh, I think we've accomplished that through the cooperative efforts of a lot of people in the community and on the third floor. And, you know, I, I feel really good about that. Um, you know, I, I've seen the language. I, you know, I may have a question or two about it, but I, I, I get the intent of it. And I'm very comfortable in doing that, Mary. So, um, and I and I commend you for um, for stepping up in terms of um, you know supporting this in terms of a gesture to the community, even though you didn't necessarily agree with it. But I think it's the right thing to do, and I commend you for doing it. Thank you. So, just so that I'm clear, then what you're proposing is the uh, article which speaks to allowing dogs to be uh, off the leash on odd number calendar days. Is that correct? Okay. Further discussion. I just had a question. Sure. <clears throat> Did um, does that the language in the article itself designate an, an area, or is it is it just odd and even as per the motion? My understanding is it's odd and even per okay. the motion. I just want to make sure. Um, you'll hear a full vetting of the article. <clears throat> um, I know they're here. I wasn't. I don't know, I mean, they probably could talk to you about it, but uh, you know, we'll have a formal vetting of it when they're ready to present. You know, they'll have a spot. You know, with all your warrant articles probably starting. Well, I'm not sure next week, but pretty quick. Um, you don't have a lot of warrant articles this year, so um, you'll have time to spend with each group quite a bit, um, and they'll you know, they'll walk you through all the details of it. Hopefully by then, uh, Tom will have worked out if we're going to add rules and regulations to the article, uh, as he's discussing with Ms. Sutton. Yeah, and, and I would just, again, the, the only thing I would add with those rules and regulations is that it'll be important to run those by council. Absolutely. So we're that doing there that. aren't any unintended consequences <clears throat> yep. that create, in Correct. particular, a legal liability to the town, which, you know, uh, I know, I know some of the things that, you're work, that you've been talking about um, are in an effort to be responsive to some of the things you've heard from the town. <clears throat> Sometimes we find that, you know, uh, something that maybe addresses one issue over here kind of creates another, another complication down the road. Um, I would just also say that it's been um, helpful that you've brought your work into us before January 20th because it gives us the ability to work with council to get things, again, that um, that, that that just works a whole lot better for um, for everybody. Discussion. Yeah. I don't know if there's going to be any, any discussion. I just wanted to thank, make sure I thank the um, folks that were initiating this this uh, warrant article and obviously the cooperative effort. <coughs> I think that uh, it may not be something we see all the time, but it makes me feel really good about the town and the process and in, in, in town meeting and, and frankly the board and, and, and the folks on the third floor that we are uh, all working together even if we don't always agree on an issue but to give people the opportunity to present their their uh, views and, and, and potentially a vote on an issue like this it speaks volumes of what kind of town we live in so can I, can I just speak real quickly? you just have to come up to the mic or if you want to come to the table 
They can't hear you on TV yes, if you're not yeah. by the mic. So I'm Katie Sutton, 245 um, Levitt Street. I just want to say thank you for considering this. I really do appreciate it. Um, we've worked really hard, and I think you guys, if you do approve this, you're doing the right thing. And I appreciate seeing our local government working the way that I think all government should work. So just want to say thank you. Thank you. I'll make a motion to submit an article to town meeting to authorize off-leash use of Bear Cove Park in the manner presented. I'll second that motion. Um, I, I just need clarity because there were two. I marked as A what I believe is being proposed. Correct. Right. So I would okay. introduce that into the record. This okay. is the proposed article that we're voting on. Yep. So I'll submit to submit as submit uh, to submit article a exhibit a exhibit a to town meeting to authorize off leash use of bear cove park you need it you have a second presented. i'll second that motion all those in favor aye aye all right next goals and objectives Thank you. ted okay um mid-year point um wanted to bring you to your goals and objectives um as you have a uh, slight break before you hit the uh, high-speed uh, escalator of town meeting warrant articles and budgets and non-stop meetings <coughs> and um, this uh, brings back to you your, your document that you have and I'll take you through that you know your, your primary goal of ensuring fiscal stability um, you had uh, um, uh, five initiatives and they're all ongoing uh, some of them I'll give you um, in a, in a look-see here uh, shortly in, in my town administrator report assessing a 10-year financial outlook and we haven't gotten to all of that um, a, a capacity of uh, for operating budget increases and ability to finance large capital projects um, we're addressing that in some different ways monitoring financial metrics is fund balance debt capital quarterly and um, quarterly department budget reviews which will be going on next week um, and of course we're managing debt long-term liabilities uh, promoting long-term economic development um, you know I know uh, Chairman Healy is working on the South Hingham study group um, in addition we're looking at um, the uh, central garage um, and um, issue uh, for a garage issue and parking issues in, in downtown um, identify and pursue opportunities to assist the neediest in our communities uh, always an ongoing effort um, in, in goal two um, you wanted to maximize asset utilization and ensure facilities are suitable um, and a lot of these are ongoing but I'll, I'll draw you to the attention of what was completed which of course you do know um, congratulations that you're able to complete the uh, um, uh, signing of the Barnes Wharf lease and um, I move that major goal forward um, in the area of delivery of services efficiently and effectively. Um, the initiatives would be to continue the aquarium litigation is ongoing. The briefs have been submitted. Uh, my understanding is the aquarium brief is due back on March 31st. Um, pursue state and federal grant funding opportunities and uh, you know ongoing as you, you uh, are aware. Um, and of course um, as we move through identifying uh, assess cost savings opportunities which we've done in our budget. Um, affordable housing uh, and housing production plan you know we haven't gotten to a housing production plan but we've certainly tackled a lot of affordable housing issues um, and I don't know if I would say complete there because I think affordable housing will be always an ongoing issue but um, some significant strides um, and then evaluate committee structures for possible efficiencies um, you know again you know something that you know you want to spend some more time with as certainly as you go through your uh, appointment processes Ted, um, on, on that, on that they have housing I, you know obviously there's been a lot of activity and I would just just restate which I think we all agreed to before is that you know there's an acute need for senior housing in this town and uh, you know obviously I think our focus is and hopefully will be in the future on trying to find more affordable housing for our seniors well I know that the uh, uh, the um, affordable housing trust is um, very much interested in expanding uh, the Lincoln School apartments and um, um, uh, and trying to expand that that service base so I think uh, you'll have partners in that yeah and the, and the good news is that if if the projects if, if a few of those proposed if that final project does get permitted the town will have achieved a safe harbor for 2030 which means that at this point we would be able to develop those that those sorts of housing units on our own terms and um, uh, that's 
that's pretty important. Yeah, I, to, just to drill home even more off what we mean by our own our terms is if you want a local preference, you can actually do it. If you want a veteran's preference, you can actually do it because you don't, you're not under the aegis of the Department of Community Housing and Development um, to dictate um, what type of preferences you can have and they're not really um, interested in local preferences on affordable housing projects. They want them to be regional. So. You know, this is a, just a little bit of a sidebar, but I'll be real quick. Um, there's an article a couple weeks ago in, in, the Glo in the Sunday Globe, I think it was in the residential section, and it was talking about the town of Brookline um, Brookline is not at their 10% threshold. They've had a number of projects come in the door. They actually have, I believe it's like six really large projects. And because they had not achieved their, um, because they had not achieved a safe harbor, all of those projects have to be permitted. And they all are permitted under the 40B statute, which means um, all of the local, many elements of the local zoning are not gonna be applied. And um, as, as I read that, I was um, uh, glad that I wasn't living in Brookline. Moving on to goal four, um, promote general welfare and stewardship. Um, you have um, six initiatives here. Um, develop town-wide uh, leasing law for possible town meeting consideration. So I, I don't think, uh, I think we're gonna have to adjust there a little bit. Um, so certainly we're dealing with the issue. Assess traffic and parking in Hingham Square. Um, uh, Chairman Healy wanted us to focus on Central Parking Garage. Um, uh, it's ongoing, but I would say, um, you know, some other things have taken up much of our time in that area. Um, promoting environmental sustainability, um, aquifer and water supply. I know the um, Water Supply Committee is um, re-energized and focusing on some of those issues. Energy recycling, similar. Um, uh, leveraging the website for social media and communications, um, ongoing always. Um, I just uh, asked Tom tonight, to, there's an article in the um, Hingham Journal today on how to um, prepare an article to town for town meeting for citizens uh, from the League of Women Voters. And um, I was given a call from a representative of the League of Women Voters to ask me to put that on the town website. So we'll actually put that um, how-to on the town website, which is actually a, a very good how-to. Um, um, continue to advance uh, Hingham Substance Abuse um, uh, Prevention Coalition, uh, which is of course ongoing. Conduct ethics and conflict of interest training for all employees and volunteers. Ted, uh, just a question, in, just for informational. Mm -hmm. I know we're just going over it tonight, and, and, and uh, if we have to adjust one of the initiatives, do we do that at some point in the near future? How does that work? We don't have to, but I know you mentioned it might need some tweaking. I don't know what that might be. I just. I really wanted this to be the start of a conversation so you knew where you were with your goals, uh, what had been done, what hadn't been done, and where you wanted to um, ask uh, us to focus um, our energies on the second half of the year, in addition to what we already know we're doing. Yeah, that's but, uh, been helpful. Thank um, you. So there are some things on there that um, I think all of you are interested in. Comments from my colleagues, questions? I, I had my comment. I, you know, I listened to what everyone else has to say. I, I think one of the things that um, I've gotten a better appreciation for in the last, particularly in the last year, is that um, uh, I think all of these goals are like really, really worthy, and I'm glad that we have them. And I think I've also gotten an appreciation that sometimes government works slower than we'd like it to or that unexpected things come up like the 40B discussion or the insurance situation that we had. And I guess just a general comment from me is that uh, while I think all of these are very worthy, um, I'd, my preference would probably be that if we have limited resources and time, I'd rather make like a lot of progress on a couple of things than try to make a little bit of progress on a lot of things. And um, I, I just, you know, the, the question of, of capacity is, is one that I have um, because uh, they're, they're all worthy, but. So I, I think I would, I would um, take that as try not to fill up the whole dance card because something's going to happen. It always does. And we need to have some organizational flexibility. Um, you know, it was quite a lift this um, fall 
um, two things that we just really hadn't anticipated at all on our agenda back in the spring. Uh, two 40Bs in front of you with two development agreements that were pretty you know, difficult issues for the board to grapple with, uh, a lot of co competing issues. Um, and then um, we needed to shift in a health care um, mood, which, which the, so the one was for you and one was for Tom and I. Uh, our time was completely drained trying to move um, you know, 1,500 employees to a new health care system in 30 days. And you know, so just, that just happened. Just a thought, because, you know, I, I sometimes think that meetings drive things kind of moving. You know, but may, maybe one thing that we could do as a board, I know we've, you've talked about having an update with the Southingham Study Group, which I'd be really interested in because I'm, I'm not as plugged into what it's doing. But, you know, may, maybe as a way to make sure that we're, um, you know, focusing on, we're balancing the short and the long term is, you know, maybe once a month at one of our meetings, we have an update on one of these things. You know, so for example, if it's, um, you know, promoting long-term economic development, the Southingham Study Group comes in and gives us some progress. And we kind of see where things are. That might, it, it might give some of these things some visibility and it, it might help kind of keep them moving. Um, just a thought. Just a quick point on yours. Um, I think it's important that we include as many practical goals and objectives in terms of what we can fit for numbers. I, I would hope people will understand that things do come up and um, we can't get to everything, but I think it shows we're listening to people if we, in fact, have some of these objectives on, on there that they care about. You know, and so we do the best we can. Uh. My volunteer service to the town, ladies and gentlemen, has been in planning uh, before I became a selectman. Um, but yet, I have continued to have a, uh, an intense interest in that activity. Um, and I see Mr. Carey in the room. Um, I think he would share my sentiment that you know, before you put a shovel in the ground, it takes years and years of effort uh, to get to that point, um, you you have to uh, identify the need, uh, come up with a uh, a proposal, um, vet it, modify it. I, in the entire time that I was having the privilege of serving as a uh, Hingham Planning Board member, uh, I can't remember a single subdivision plan that was approved as submitted. They all undergo a change. Um, I'm very, very excited about the 3A corridor study. I've talked to uh, our town engineer, Roger Fernandez, about coming in and um, giving a, uh, an interim report. Um, I'm asking Mr. Reardon uh, when his schedule permits uh, to come in and give us an update on the work that's being done in the harbor. I think that resiliency in the harbor is critical to its long-term sustainability. Uh, I think those wharfs have to be addressed. Um, in the square, we committed last year uh, to residents to study the issues with respect to parking and the uh, safe flow of traffic. Um, I'm trying to combine that with the study of a potential um, parking garage. You know, the, the Hingham Square um, survives because people are committed to making it survive, whether it's how it's permitted, uh, how it's patronized. And, and where it's placed in the, uh, in the eyes of, of the town and its, in the community in terms of its importance. Losing that small hometown feel, um, you know, is, is something that you, if you're not careful, you don't know it's gone until it's not there. Um, you know, we, we're bookended on either end of town by large shopping um, centers. Derby Shops is a very successful undertaking and it deserves a lot of credit. Uh, the shipyard continues to grow in its vitality um, and, and I'm glad that it succeeded. Um, you know, we have a, a number of initiatives in our second goal 
and, and quite frankly, that's going to require us to, um, you know, examine the needs. You know, we've talked about the town hall here. Uh, you know, the the senior, the needs for an increased senior center, recreation facility. Um, the library uh, is talking to us. Uh, the fire station. And we're, we're trying to figure out a uh, a solution that will propel the firefighting mission forward and sustain us for three quarters of a century. Uh, that requires a lot of effort. Um, it, done correctly, we may be able to manage this to you know three stations as opposed to four. Um, given the current conditions on the ground. Uh, these are all things that require <clears throat> long, long, you know, efforts, committed residents. Uh, it isn't just done by the three of us and, and Ted and Tom. Uh, this, this requires the commitment of committees, you know, charged with this kind of responsibility. Um, you know, we're going to have to figure something out on that uh, soon. Um, Mary spoke to South Hingham Working Group. Uh, when I was elected initially, uh, I felt that it would be important for the permitting boards, i.e. the ZBA and the planning board, CONCOM, Board of Health, Sewer Commission, to have a working paper um, as to the conditions on the ground up in South Hingham or down in South Hingham. Um, we are in the process, ladies and gentlemen, of completing that. We had a meeting Tuesday night where we had a very informative discussion with respect to the water supply, uh, maximum daily demand, uh, anticipated future use, uh, the water tank up in South Hingham. Um, it's, it's coming offline this year to be painted. Uh, we talked about the provisions with respect to how it's maintained, how the water pressure is maintained uh, while it's down. Um, we all in our own ways work on different issues and efforts um, we're going to have that report for you very soon Good. and um, you know we're going to be speaking to uh, you know the water the traffic the sewer uh, you know we've talked about workplace housing as, as part of that discussion uh, for you know the idea is to cultivate young families uh, with the opportunity to come in um, you know, Ted's talked about avoiding the onus of 40B. Um, I still think affordable housing is something that we have to continuously commit to, uh, regardless of whether we've reached any 10% figure. Um, and if, if we are fortunate enough to accomplish that uh, in the coming months, um, that'll give us a marvelous opportunity to uh, develop the kind of affordability that uh, speaks to our own local residents uh, or, or perhaps the veterans uh, or, or the seniors that live within our uh, town and, and want to stay. Um, I think we're only confined by our own imagination. You know, I, I, I want, I'm, I'm hoping that at, at some point in the near future, the issue of uh, in-law apartments is revisited. I think that that speaks to the uh, affordability uh, issue and um, the ability of people who, who age uh, to continue to be able to live in their homes in such a way that uh, they can afford it and, and provide the opportunity uh, for their succeeding generations to enjoy the property. So uh, that's kind of where I am on all this. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a work in progress. I appreciate the support. I appreciate people continuing to step forward. And, and serve on these committees because uh, this is hard work done right. It takes a lot of commitment. Um, uh, working in a collaborative way, uh, you just I, I just don't think you can expect the same group of people to be here year in, year out uh, doing this type of thing. Uh, I think there's a shelf life after a certain point. So that's, I, I thank you for that presentation. I thank you for the work that uh, the two of you did on the 40B issue in the fall. That's, that's extraordinarily difficult, highly emotional. Uh, land use issues are always difficult. Uh, you know, I got used to saying no to people. Uh, while I sat on the planning board, you know, you, you never made everybody happy. Uh, 40B especially, 
uh, that that is that that's a hair shirt. Um, I, I don't know how else to put it, but um, you know, we got through the health insurance, which I'm very happy about. Um, so I think we're doing well. Um, we don't always agree on everything, but so what? Um, that's that's not a bad thing. Um, and you know, we're fleshing out ideas. We can we have a guidepost. Uh, I thank my colleagues for getting the Bonds Wharf uh, lease done. Um, grappling with difficult personnel issue um, issues. I thank the departments for all their hard work. Uh, it shows in every way, every day in this town. Um, you know, it, it snowed Saturday, and uh, you, you could traverse this town safely, notwithstanding the, the poor weather conditions. Can't say that about other towns. So, anyways, that's my little speech, and thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Always good to have a friend in the audience. <laughs> I give you that twenty later. <laughs> They're all standing at home. You have um, one more vote on your agenda before you get into uh, appointments. Um, uh, uh, sorry, not appointments. Uh, selectman and town administrator reports. So I'll be giving you your financial okay summary. I'll entertain a motion that the uh, board is authorized by Article 12 of the 2012 Annual Town Meeting execute that certain declaration of restrictions granting restrictions on Parcel 1 to the National Park Service. Can we give you an overview of this? Please. Please. Um, several years ago, Town Meeting approved uh, the ability for us to petition the legislature, the state, uh, the National Park Service to essentially swap the designation on two pieces of land. If you go into Bear Cove Park uh, off of Fort Hill Street, you'll see a grouping of um, brick buildings, former credit union building, um, and, a, and a parking lot right behind it. That space is actually uh, designated as official open as official and open space and wouldn't be eligible to be built on for a fire station. Um, behind it um, is um, about 10 acres of land that are ball fields that the town uh, spent uh, uh, close to $3 million developing uh, a decade ago. And those are not official and open space. So in theory, we could put the fire station there um, in the middle of those fields, but not over there by the street where we'd want it, um, um, where it has an asphalt surface already. And so we asked the Park Service if we could switch, and um, they agreed to it um, through um, uh, what they call a uh, um, um, declaration of restrictions and so you're essentially giving them restrictions on the back land uh, making it official and open space and they're giving you the <coughs> use of the front land to use as your intended purpose for the fire station um, building committee thank you I have a motion please so moved second all in favor aye, aye. speaking to your comment about government Mary I did notice it was voted in October uh, uh, 2012 and we, we're just we're just getting it done. Oh. <laughs> you know, we had to go to the state and go to the federal government. And everybody had to sign off on it, and um, it uh, takes some time. Okay, um, we're going to be going into executive session, but before we do that, Tom, is there anything you'd like to? Add? I'm good, thank you. Well, we do have town administrator reports, and I have a fairly big report for you. Okay, all right. I'm going to take you through some financial. Do a um, position in long-term planning. You guys should all have this in your package. Nope. Nope. They don't. Okay. I thought this was in your package. I have extra copies for yeah. the uh, audience if anyone would like uh, to look at this. Actually, two more. Can we get a few more copies? Oops. Let me have one more. Uh, I think three more, please. Thank you. Thank you. No. That? I think we've got one for each year. <laughs> that one extra. <laughs> Okie dokie. So in, in conjunction with your goals and objectives, um, and giving you a, a, a spot, um, a, a, a six month look at that, um, I, I thought that as you close out your your budget process this year, um, you're getting ready to vote budgets for the year, I thought I would give you an overview of what your financial position is and some long-term planning, planning ideas to begin a conversation um, that I, I have heard at least circling around, but um, people haven't yet figured out 
which which way to approach it. So I, I think um, this pr the purpose of this presentation is to show you where you stand. Uh, use uh, Chairman Healy's uh, phrase from a second ago: conditions on the ground as of January or you know, essentially the end of of uh, 2016. Um, so the date on this should read 12, uh, January 12, 2017. Because um, this early is early in the year. This is as of uh, <laughs> this is as of uh, uh, that'll happen through February. We understand February. what you meant. <laughs> as of the end of the year. We're just um, talking about that. That's right. All right. So uh, I'm going to cover in this um, uh, the uh, FY um, 2016 audit results, um, your long-term liabilities. I'm going to walk you through your op annual operating budget, your forecast give you uh, some overview of your bond ratings and, and uh, bring you into your capital assets and, and talk to you about moving forward on some of these initiatives. So if we start, um, audit results. Um, I, I like to start with audit results having an auditor background, but I think it does give some level of assurance as to the strength of an organization. In your case, um, I would say the highest strength. You got an unqualified audit opinion. It's the highest possible opinion. You heard from your auditors earlier. Uh, they indicated no strong, no internal control weaknesses and strong fund, finan uh, fund balances, which I would equate to financial statements. This isn't the first one of these, though. This is the 25th one of these in a row. And so I think um, you should take strong um, confidence that the town of Hingham has been um, from a financial situation, uh, always, um, or for several decades now, a very strong organization. Um, your long-term liabilities. Uh, you heard a presentation on OPEB earlier. Um, I'm going to start out with pensions. Um, and these, these are your, um, you know, your three groupings of your long-term liabilities. Your pension um, has, uh, as of uh, the end of, um, as, the, as of the beginning of 2016, uh, 95 uh, million in assets and um, unfunded liabilities for pensions of about 53 million. Uh, you're funded at about a 68% a rate and your funding schedule will take you to 2020, uh, 2035 at an assumed rate of 7.75%. and uh, 7 As I told you earlier, um, Retirement Board is going to begin working on lowering those investment assumptions. Hopefully they can do it in the face of gains one year where they have an investment gain so it doesn't affect your appropriation. I want to point out that the pensions are managed by the Hingham Contributory Retirement Board, but all the assets are managed by the PRIM Board, the Pension Reserves Investment Board. Um, they manage um, um, uh, close to $90 billion worth of assets across a variety of uh, the state and, and um, a variety of communities. Um, in respect to OPEB, the funds that we um, invest in OPEB are also managed by the PRIM. Um, they have a separate segment of the PRIP fund that manages the health care trust for the state. Um, we uh, advocated for about five or six years to get the state to agree to do this for us here. Um, and so this avoids um, some of the things you heard Linda say that um, setting up an investment policy, hiring investment managers and figuring out how to invest $10 million. We could send it to Prim and they could invest it the same way they're investing the pension system. And as of right now, your OPEB um, investment vehicles and your pensions are similar in nature. That may not always be the case, and you'll have to keep an eye on it. I, I have a feeling many of us won't be here when it's not the case, but as your pension becomes fully funded, um, you may make decisions on in 2035 or thereabouts to change how you allocate, and you might not do that in your OPEB because you have a longer window. Your other aspect of long-term debt is, uh, sorry, of long-term liabilities are your debt service. And so for a municipality, if you can manage your pensions, your OPEB, and your debt service, um, you've covered um, you know, your three core long-term financial liabilities. Uh, here, I'm going to show you your debt service in two areas. One is excluded debt. So this is the amount of debt you carry, which by far is the largest amount of your debt. Um, and it's excluded from the constraints of Prop 2 and a half, which means that the voters have voted in an election to allow you to uh, increase their taxes for the debt service cost of the projects that, um, that uh, were part of these issues. 
And what you can see on this chart is that you know we're running at about seven million a year, and it'll drop to six and a half next year, and down to six in 2020, um, 21 around six. But in 2022, it drops uh, two million dollars down to 3.9 million, and it's a fairly steep decline. And that is when the um, high school and South Elementary School project um, is um, uh, will have uh, been fully amortized. The cumulative debt retirements from this over the next four years will be uh, a $3.1 million. And that's debt service. And that's debt so service. So that means that it... A $3 million um, annual debt service um, could fund, you know, somewhere to, you know, 70 to $80 million worth of capital projects, potentially. Um, your next uh, chart would be your debt service non-excluded debt. And so this is the debt that's within your operating budget. Um, you, you need to pay for this within the, within the constraints of Prop 2.5, and, and you cannot ask taxpayers for, for, for extra money for that. Um, and um, you can see that it's uh, fairly stable at 2.1 million, decreasing by about 100,000 a year. Um, um, and then you start to see a little bit of a drop off four years out. Uh, it's about a half a million dollars over a five year window. So that's... And so that would finance um, another um, good amount of money. We're going <laughs> to get to all that in a second, though. So um, I'm going to get you there. But I'm glad that you're thinking along those ways, because that was the purpose of the presentation. It was intended to be a leading question. Correct. <laughs> Annual operating budgets. Um, I'm going to step away from long-term liabilities. There is one more. I'll get to it in a second. But right now, we'll just jump into annual operating budgets. Um, you know, YFY 2017 status, mid-year reviews will be scheduled for um, the week of January 23rd. As of now, we have no concerns identified in the operating budget for this year, which is not uncommon at this point in time. Uh, the uh, next page is your five-year forecast. This is your current five-year forecast. Um, and if I can just briefly walk you through this, um, I'm not going to get into too many details um, in, unless you, you desire to ask me. Um, but overall, what you can see here is in your current year, you're projecting a $50,000 surplus at the end of the year. And, and that's consistent with, we came out of town meeting with a zero, but you know, we balanced the budget out of town meeting. But we got a little extra growth um, and some changes in the state aid numbers that changed the bottom line a little bit there. Um, I will tell you, though, that during 17, um, you will receive um, some substantial one-time revenue. Um, could be as, um, as high as um, you know, $800,000 as you receive permits from the, um, we've already received the Linden Ponds permit, and we will building permit for their um, uh, development. And then uh, the Avalon development at the shipyard, um, we should receive that permit sometime in March. And that would be, um, you know, in that half a million dollar range too. So we're, we we could get close to a million dollars in one time money, which we will not be adding into the continuing revenue budget because. Hey, uh, just a question. I, so uh, of course I don't know what the numbers were prior to the, this chart being put together, but so we we've we've moved in the right direction since the last mm -hmm. five year forecast or not? Yeah, I'm going to get to the second column right now and give you some updates on that. So yeah, in the in the second column. Uh, sorry, the third column, rather, the 2018 numbers. Right now, we're still where we were when we um, went through, you know, most of your budgets. Um, we've adopted the changes in health care because um, we are moving into the GIC. Um, this number is um, right now reflecting a $700,000 deficit. It includes all the town administrator recommendations um, and includes the school department at the forecasted amount of 2%. And only because the school department budget process comes a little bit after our process, not because we've decided to give them two. Yeah, and I would, I would just, um, I'm, I'm the school liaison, so I got the preliminary budget, the starting point, it kind of gets whittled down, the school department is mm -hmm. working right now across, across the building, um, but the, um, the uh, if I were to put the administration starting point for the budget in, FY18, that deficit would go to two million. So there's a, the, I the starting points about so a million I, three higher if than. If Mary hadn't said that, what I would have said to you is that when I get the school budget, your next forecast, which will likely be the end of January, will have that number included in it. And, and I wasn't asking about 18, and obviously that's important since we're we're gearing up. I was just for some reason I was looking at 17 as we as we wind it down, 
you mentioned there would be an infusion, I thought, in fiscal year 17. Correct. We're going to have a large surplus in fiscal 17. We, we didn't budget for a million dollars worth of building permits that will be right. coming in or close to it from the 240B developments that you, uh, well, 140B development. Um, and, um, and the Linden Ponds, uh, we hadn't budgeted or anticipated, we don't budget, anticipate that they were going to complete that phase of their development uh, during this fiscal year. So all, both of those revenues will be coming this year. Um, and, um, but they're not in here now. Well, they wouldn't, and they're not in here now because we don't change our budget mid-year uh, to reflect higher revenue estimates. But we wouldn't put them in anyway because they're one-time numbers. But I'm letting you know that they're still coming. Um, they're one-time numbers because we're going to get a building permit from Avalon. We're not going to do another Avalon next year, so there won't be another building permit like that coming in. So I don't want you to raise your local revenues thinking you can spend at that pace. That money's not going to be there the following year. Yeah, I guess I was making the assumption that going back into the beginning of fiscal year 17, there were projections for that year. And as the year progresses, I thought we did update the numbers, um, whether they're going in the right direction or not. But you're saying that we, even though money's going to come in in fiscal 17, we're not going to include it in a... No, no, no. We, we, we obviously, we'll include it, but we don't, we don't change the forecast as we go through. Um, um, eventually, the 17 estimates will move over into 16 actuals, and it'll reflect what we brought in. Okay. I will always advise you if we're bringing in money above and beyond what we've budgeted so that you guys can make decisions about how you want to allocate that. And that's what you're going to be up against this year, because as we get to this budget, um, I think advisory will probably look at, at, at fund balance to um, address some of the issues. And in the past, they've used fund balance. Um, they've, been able, they've been more willing to draw fund balance down if they knew there was revenue coming in that was already going to replenish it. You have a million coming in that will replenish your fund balance um, or close to it already. So that was the reason for that. Yep. Um, the real focus on this forecast, though, is, um, you know, we rolled in the growth estimate <coughs> of um, some of the projects that have been recently approved, uh, the Linden Ponds project and the, um, and the um, Avalon project. We did not put the Alliance project in here for people who have I've been asked um, several times about that. And the reason we haven't is it hasn't moved through its permitting stages. I mean, you might have a development agreement, but it still needs to be permitted by the ZBA. It still needs to go through the appeal process. So before we start counting on the dollars, I'd like to see them get a little closer to the building permit. Um, and so you can see those numbers increasing in, in 19 and 20. There may be some shift if the construction doesn't happen quite as fast where that number moves into uh, a little less in 19, a little more in 20 and 21. But the effect, if you look on the bottom line, is uh, and if you pull the forecast out from several months ago, you'd see all your out years as negative numbers and increasing negative numbers. And now you see your out years being you know, essentially um, balanced um, or positive. Um, $114,000 deficit in 19, a $300,000 surplus in 20, um, a $50,000 deficit in 21, and a, a $1.4 million surplus in 22. Now, though, by no means do I want to, to, you know, for you to start banking on each of these numbers. The purpose is to show you that from a fiscal standpoint, you looked at your long-term liabilities. Your operating budgets are manageable over the, the foreseeable future, which I call the three to five year window. It's not foreseeable past five years. Anyone tells you that, it's really not. You, you, you don't have any major issues. You don't have any structural imbalances. You should be able to manage your operating budgets. It will be challenging, because there will always be people who want more than you can afford. The other thing it kind of says to me as we, as we look at this is that um, you know, sometimes as, as one-time money comes in, there's always this, you know, do you balance your budget on one-time money? Are you creating a structural deficit? And that's where I think looking at the out years is really helpful. And when you see numbers that don't have brackets on it or, you know, small numbers with brackets, I think it, it, it makes, it, it, it reduces the risk of using one-time money. So I'm going to take you now to your bond rating. Um, your AAA status was reaffirmed by all three bond ratings agencies during fiscal 16. I've given you some quotes here from each of them. Um, Moody's indicated, um, among other things, the town has established a strong trend of positive financial operations, finishing fiscal 14 with its fifth consecutive year of general fund balance growth. I mean, I think we could say that that's now our seventh year. Uh, quote uh, from SMP, in our view, Hingham's debt and contingent 
liability profile is very strong. Approximately 66.1% of the direct debt is scheduled to be paid, repaid within the next 10 years, which in our view are positive credit factors. Again, you saw the chart that showed the jet dropping off, and here you're seeing the comment from the rating agency. Um, <coughs> um, another comment from uh, Fitch, the reliability and stability of a primary property tax generated revenue stream combined with careful expenditure management had led, has led to a robust level of reserves over the past five years. Um, and you know these reports are on our website. Um, you'll be able to see the comments in there. There's plenty of other um, good comments. Tom was uh, uh, able to pull out a few um, appropriate ones for us. So now we move to what I would call your last version of liabilities. I don't know why people call assets liabilities, my accounting professors would shudder, but in the municipal government side, assets become liabilities because you need to rebuild them. And um, we have uh, total assets of $210 million on our books. And I've given you some areas of need. Um, I have ordered these per, you know, my ideas, I see them, and it's mine. It's not, you, you know, you, you're free to do it as you please. There's no, no prioritization whatsoever. But just as I went through it, things I see people working on in, in some level of sequence. Um, in, in the area of the town, we, we clearly have identified fire stations. We have a north fire station and a south fire station. I've allocated um, six million on each of these projects. Uh, I don't want the committees to jump up and down and get all excited if it's not quite that number. I'm just trying to give you an order of magnitude so you can sort of get your hands around what all of the projects are that are out there. This project could certainly um, see uh, the north station one go a little higher, and we haven't even found a spot um, or a decision on south station yet. Um, the senior center, um, we have a $4 million number in here. Uh, I certainly say with building costs, this could be in the four and a half to $5 million range. Um, you'll hear, um, hopefully within the next few weeks, um, a report from the town hall building committee, um, you know, where they're looking at some ideas. I know they're preparing a warrant article for um, some beginning money to look at the senior center here in this building and uh, the police station here in this building. Um, the library um, is proposing um, a, a large renovation of their library at, at 23 million, and you'll hear some of that discussion at your next meeting. Um, the police station, um, our plan would be to try to renovate it within this space. Um, I have a $2 million number here. Again, some flexibility there. Uh, I would point out, though, that one of the reasons we're thinking of this, not to steal all the thunder of the committees that are going to look at this, but um, just go take a look at what senior centers been costing around our region um, when they build them as freestanding units. Um, these numbers usually are not, um, you know, maybe you're lucky if you get a seven figure number, but you're probably in the eight figures. Police stations guaranteed in the eight figures, without a doubt. So to be able to renovate within the buildings, um, sort of the tradition of Hingham, we renovate the buildings and get a lot more life out of them over a long period of time. If you remember Central Fire Station, the proposal was to tear it down and build a new one. And that was the only way it was possible. But we're now in a renovated building doing very well and, you know, you know for the next 20 to 30 years. Ted, in, the, in your <clears throat> estimations with the senior center, the police station, and the rec center, are these all assuming that they're all going to stay in their present locations? That's what, that's what I am at this point in time for this purpose. And by no means, you know, uh, again, that's just, I was trying to give you a starting point. So, you know, if you decide that you don't think it should be here and be somewhere else, then those cost structures have to change. But if they are going to stay here, that's what w would be tagged here on these numbers. Um, recreation center, um, you know, clearly um, we have some issues here at Town Hall. Um, you're going to have to make a decision um, renovating this building for a senior center, a police station, and a recreation center is just not going to be practical with the parking problems that we have at the building. We've already um, essentially violated our 2003 uh, ZBA permit in terms of activity here already, and um, I'm, I'm just grateful the neighbors haven't been more upset with us. <coughs> so, um, Let's keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, you'll have to deal with the recreation center. Uh, building 179 was one of the ideas. Um, there could be other spots and other places, but I think allocating around two and a half million is appropriate in that in that range. 
Um, I know that you could do Building 179 for something along those lines. Um, I didn't list the harbor, all the harbor um, uh, projects. You know many of them, but I did put down here that they're funded via harbor revenues. And that would, that's an important consideration for you as you try to figure out how you're going to pay for all these. Um, you should be able to pay for um, most, if not all, of the harbor um, ideas that you've um, been presented through the revenue structures that are created within that, that harbor. Uh, the pool uh, for the country club, and you, know, you, uh, you might have seen an email today on the um, funding um, approval from CPC last night, and they're going to be bringing forward to you to study uh, for an indoor pool. Um, but again, the country club has always maintained that any um, activity up there, uh, pool or their maintenance facility um, underneath that, would be funded through their revenue structure. They also have some debt that's expiring in a few years, and I think they're going to be looking to fill that with, um, uh, with uh, a new facility. Infrastructure. Um, you know, your roads, um, you, you took a significant step forward on your roads, um, funded via bond issue last year, in addition to, of course, state highway money, and, um, and made some, some great strides there. And then sewer is your last infrastructure, um, funded via sewer revenue. Um, school buildings, and I didn't detail the school buildings um, here as a school department, um, you know, obviously we'll be letting you know the needs that they have. And so these are your your capital needs as I see them now um, and uh, you know I, I left the next slide as just simply process and timeline um, each of these projects um, you know we could schedule them out for you and tell you how they would move through a process um, it's I think it would be better to get a little bit more detail as to um, uh, meeting with some of the committees and what you what you think you would like to move forward on and timeline uh, um, I will tell you that um, you know it's possible to do a lot of projects currently um, and um, it's possible to do them before some of your debt expires because um, we don't actually place new debt on a project for several years um, after we begin the process of building it so the middle school debt uh, was placed um, just just um, uh, was it placed uh, in 16 sewer or 15? In 15. And we, we, we concluded the building of that, you know, much prior to that. So um, you, you have some timeline advantages, and I can explore those with you as you tell me which areas you want to go. Well, thanks very much for that, Ted. Good snapshot, good update. Well, thanks. Um, thank you. This is, a, you know, this is, this is the beginning of a big conversation. I mean, this is, there's, there's a lot of great work here, and it's um, uh, in many ways it is it is only the beginning of the conversation. Just a, a couple things. I just want to fill in on the school side because I think, um, uh, as a liaison, I'm aware that you know from the school department's perspective, um, the curriculum changes to physical education and some mandates. Um, the school department is still. Uh, actively pursuing the idea of um, some sort of additional physical fitness and health classroom space um, and I think they also heard you know they they as they socialized that last year I think they heard some different things and they're working on that um, the Plymouth River depending upon um, uh, you know what happens with the Broadstone Bear Cove there are some facility needs there and and also at Foster School you know on the on the tour um, you know some of those systems are original it's um, I was not at the tour that day but um, there are a number of issues I think we also have um, an ad hoc field committee and while they haven't met recently um, I think that you know that that that's also kind of out there so it's it's going to be important to do that um, as we think about this and I realize this is not an agenda item so it would be it would not be appropriate for us to probably talk about this in detail um, but as I'm sort of looking at this list one of the things that jumps out to me is that um, I think from the taxpayers perspective they're going to want to know that we're sort of all talking to each other on these projects and we just don't have all these projects going in silos because there's probably some opportunities so for example if you're building a pool at the country club is there some opportunity to create some recreation space or if you are um, uh, if if there is a uh, renovation going on at the library is there you know I think there 
there could potentially be some synergies here. And so I think that um, as we continue this conversation, um, that's going to be important. And I guess the last thing I'd say is that I think that um, some of these projects have been more socialized than others. And I think we need to um, take that in mind as well. Um, we've, we've heard a lot about, uh, um, we've, we've heard more about these, some of these projects than others. And um, it'll be important to make sure that we engage a discussion with the community about what's happening um, so that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot here. One of my primary reasons for giving this to you is that I, I felt that um, as I talked to each of the groups that are working on these projects, a lot of angst as to, you know, how's the town, which one's going to go forward first? That's always a, a question. You had a little bit of that discussion last year on the Hawk project. And then, you know, how are we going to pay for all this? And I, I felt a little bit, there's been a little bit of a paralysis of, of um, you know, not understanding how to get my arms around it all. So I wanted to put it all together and show you that in light of also your financial position and your other liabilities and your other revenues that you can start to see a path, which I can uh, for you, um, that based on these cost numbers um, that you can probably accomplish most of these projects without significantly increasing your property taxes. And you know that's really your goal, I think, in a lot of cases. So I think um, you know you want to start having those conversations and, and get into that. Yeah, but let me just also just because you know I see Carol here, and I, I don't want you know next week in the Hingham Journal it to say you know town can build a hundred million dollars of projects without raising taxes. I think there's. I didn't a, say that. I know. Well, I. Think, I know Carol wouldn't. I think that's like what that. you know. That's what people can hear, and and. So I think what, what Ted's done, and this is an excellent analysis, is that it says that, you know, in, in particular with our excluded debt, what we essentially, when, when we do a debt exclusion, we say, hey, taxpayers, can we raise your taxes for 20 years? So we did that on the middle school. Can we raise your taxes by, you know, $300 a year for 20 years? And so what's happening is that as those projects roll off, if, if we were going to let things happen organically, the tax bill would sort of go down a little bit. And so what, but, but the other important piece is that we have a financial policy in the town that the advisory committee is stewards of. And what, what in a sense this is saying is it's freeing up the possibility to talk about these things because of the capacity that we have. Um, but I, I think we want to be careful at how we characterize some of this because um, because uh, nothing's free. Nothing is free. We are in agreement. <laughs> Chairman, I think uh, Mr. Carey has a Mr. question. Mr. Carey, join us. It is the beginning of the conversation, and I don't want to start it. But We're not posted, so. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not. I'll be, I'll be in front of you with the hats I wear, and we'll be talking about a lot of these details. Um, I just thought that at the beginning of this conversation, it, it might be helpful to reflect on how things have been done in the past. I, I've been, as I'm I have been looking at all of these growing needs, the case for which is quite obvious and will be easy to make, certainly with regard to the senior center and, and the police department. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that it's roughly 25 years since I was working on the town hall project the last time. We did that planning in 1991 it may seem like since the building was dedicated in 98, well, it's not a quarter of a century, but it's really a quarter of a century since we were doing the thinking and the planning. Um, in the reports I wrote at that time, which have since been edited to suggest that 
we can't really look 35 years ahead. I'm, I'm afraid I might have used that time frame. Um, but in those reports, I, I remarked that it had been about 30 years since the town had done a comprehensive review of its townside needs, and that essentially no major construction work on that side had been done. One of the moving forces, of course, at the time was dealing with the vacant Central Junior High. And that gave us the opportunity to rethink all of these buildings that were around, single purpose buildings, inadequate, consolidate, get the synergies of operations. It's 25 years later, we moved the senior center from 500 square feet to 5,000 square feet of beautiful space and they've had a wonderful experience there, but they're bursting at the seams and they're growing. Uh, police department, we went from an inadequate small facility that barely holds a dentist's office today. It was in abysmal shape and, and uh, almost as old as some of our fire stations um, in, into a nice modern facility, tight but good. Um, Dispatch is cannibalized, places grown, additional needs are there. At the time, everyone was looking at the possibility we'd build a new senior center, we'd build a new police station, we'd build a new this, and the consolidation at Town Hall gave everyone what they needed at a, at a price that, that would bring tears to anybody's eyes today, $8 million for the whole package. But what the past quarter century has proved, even though we now need to provide more space, is that synergy, that consolidation, everybody being near each other, the schools being next door so their administrator could talk to the town administrator, um, was extremely successful. So I would suggest that it's important to take a hard look, as our, my committee is going to recommend, into the ability to achieve this in the current location because it would preserve all of those improvements in operations. And I guarantee you it will be cheaper than having to go out and build a new police station and a new senior center and so on and so forth. Um, so the specifics will all be addressed. But the primary point I want to make is that in the intervening quarter century, even though we have done a lot to maintain and build up our infrastructure, new light plant, DPW, other projects, the fact of the matter is that the infrastructure necessary for some essential components of townside operations um, has not kept pace with the needs. And historically, that's about the time. We've done a good job on the schools. We always do. We've kept them up. But we're at a point, apropos of the comments earlier, that these things take time. A, a, a consensus has to develop. There, there's a time and a rhythm to these things. And my suggestion to you, based on my past experience and, and knowledge of the information that's going to be brought forward, that this is one of those times where it's going to be appropriate to take a big whack at all of these needs on the town side. And to be fortunate enough to be in the financial position that Ted has described and to be able to see the possibility that with a schedule and approaching things in a certain order, it, it would be possible to update all of this, improve it, give people the services they need with relatively minimal impacts on the property tax rate or conceivably, don't say it, maybe none, I can't believe none, but uh, it looks as though we're in a financial position to do it. I think a quarter of a century is long enough and the, the needs we will show 
will demonstrate that this would be a good time. And Hingham has always, in its own way, uh, had a good sense of timing on where priorities ought to be and, and likes the idea of looking at an overall solution to needs that makes sense vis-a-vis -vis individual isolated things coming forward. Um, and the potential exists right now to have that kind of an overview. And that's the conversation that I think that we're, we're about to begin. It obviously will, will extend for years. It will go through various levels. Uh, but I think it's a productive time to be doing that. Well, thank you for your willingness to continue participating. Happy certainly time. value your expertise and experience on all of this. Thank you. You have one more item of business, um, brief as it is, but one more um, executive session. Yes, uh, before we sign off. I'm good. Oh. I uh, just uh, we got our invitation for um, Lincoln Day, which is Saturday, February 11th. I know that's about a month away, but it always comes up quickly. So um, I'm sure that we'll hear more about that. But just want to put that date out there for the community. That's a great take, ladies and gentlemen. If you've never been to it, uh, really takes you back in time, and uh, it's it's held at the old Chip Church, and it's. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, if you happen to be doing business in the town hall on the first floor outside of the uh, clerk's office and the assessor's office, Derby Academy, sixth grade, did presidential portraits. And uh, apparently the uh, class studied uh, American portrait artist Gilbert Stewart, John Singleton Copley, and uh, there's a whole series of pictures on the walls adorning the, the hallway there uh, of, of the presidents of our country. Um, I took a look at them coming in tonight, and I, I have to commend the uh, student who did Franklin Roosevelt. I thought it was actually quite impressive. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, you, if you are in town hall, please check that out. It's, it's well worth the look. Um, at this time, the board will enter executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with DPW supervisors because discussion of this matter opens. No, no, no. Wrong one. Wrong one. Close. <laughs> on, on the agenda. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, at this time, uh, the board will enter executive right. session to discuss strategy with respect to amending the 2014-2017 <clears throat> collective bargaining agreement concerning the fire prevention officer because discussion of this matter in open session may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the town. Welcome. Aye. 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 Good night, ladies Thanks. and gentlemen. Good night. Good night.